Okay, this is a lecture on David Hume and his, uh, his empiricism in general, but uh, the greatest portion of this lecture will concern the problem of induction and where he takes empiricism after Berkeley. So uh, to begin that, let me share my screen. Slideshow, uh, slideshow from the beginning. There we are. All right. So this is David Hume, and again, I'm focusing on in this lecture on the problem of induction. So David Hume is the third of the three British empiricists that we are looking at in this course. We've already looked at David uh, John Locke and George Berkeley, and now we're moving on to Hume. And Hume sort of does to Berkeley what Berkeley does to Locke. And what do I mean by that? Well, he claims that Berkeley isn't taking empiricism far enough and is actually betraying some of the central tenets of empiricism by uh, Berkeley's own um, subjective idealism. Remember, Berkeley is the one who ends up being an idealist. Now, recall that Berkeley accuses Locke of illicitly positing physical substance despite the fact that we never perceive physical substance directly. And so remember that was Barclay's, one of Barclay's criticisms of Locke, which is Locke is employing this notion of physical substance, but Locke himself admits we never actually experience or perceive physical substance. Well, that's inconsistent with the tenets of empiricism. Empiricism wants to say that nothing is in the mind that wasn't first in the senses. Locke is admitting physical substance is never in the sub, uh, senses, and yet he's using it as a concept in his mind. This move is illicit on empiricist grounds, since any concept to be legitimate must arise from experience. Now Hume accuses Berkeley essentially of doing the same thing because he says, look, Berkeley is illicitly positing mental substance. He talks about minds. And what Hume is saying is, but I don't have any experience of mental substance. I never perceive mental substance, uh, not even my own mind do I perceive. And he has an interesting line of argument here. Do I ever experience mental substance? Do I ever experience my mind? No, says Hume. Now, why is that? Quoting from Hume, he says, for my part, when I enter most intimately into what I call myself, I always stumble on some particular perception or other of heat or cold, light or shade, love or hatred, pain or pleasure. I never catch myself at any time without a perception and can never observe anything but the perception. When all my perceptions are removed for any time as by sound sleep, so long as I am insensible of myself and may truly be said not to exist. So my mental life, this is me talking now, my mental life from Hume's perspective, my mental life is nothing other than this constant cascading of sensation after sensation after sensation. Here's a pain, here's a pleasure, here's a worry, here's a doubt, here's a sound sensation, here's a smell sensation. And so you have this um, uh, again, uh, an ongoing cascading of actual experiences, what you don't have is anything permanent, anything stable or fixed, anything enduring. What Hume is saying is what you don't have is anything substantial, again, that endures over time. And you might know, say, well, it's underneath all of that. What? Again, what Hume says is if I removed all the individual perceptions I was just talking about a moment ago, there'd be nothing left, right? That's all there is to me. That's all there is to my mental uh, life. Again, were all my perceptions removed by death, I, um, and could I neither think nor feel nor see nor love nor hate after the dissolution of my body, I should be entirely annihilated. Nor do I conceive what is further requisite to make me a perfect non-entity. There's simply nothing there, there's nothing left. If anyone upon serious unprejudiced reflection thinks he has a different notion of himself, I must confess, I can reason no longer with him. I can allow him this, 
that he may be in the right as well as I, and that we are essentially different in this particular. He may perhaps perceive something simple and continued, which he calls himself, though I am certain there's no such principle in me. What he's saying there is simply this, okay, if you have a different inner life and you perceive an enduring substance that is yourself, well, then you and he are simply fundamentally different in that respect. But he doesn't really think that's the case. He doesn't think anyone has uh, an additional um, component to their internal mental experiences than he. Quoting for, again from Hume, our eyes cannot turn in their sockets without varying our perception. Our thought is still more variable than our sight and all our other senses and faculties contribute to this change. Nor is there any single power of the soul which remains unalterably the same, perhaps for a moment. So he's saying, look, nothing could be clearer about the, na the nature of our internal life than it's constantly flowing and changing. There is nothing substantial. Notice echoes here of, uh, of Heraclitus, right? Heraclitus, the um, pre-Socratic ancient Greek philosopher who famously had said, you can't step your same foot, you can't step your foot into the same river twice. Why is that? By the time you've got your second foot in there, it's all different. But if we think of consciousness as a streaming river, uh, we can't step our foot into the same river twice there either. There is nothing which is permanent or fixed or stable. There is no enduring substance. Oops. The mind is a kind of theater where several perceptions successively make their appearance, pass, repass, glide away, and mingle in an infinite variety of postures and situations. There is properly no simplicity in it at one time, nor identity and difference, whatever natural propension we may have to imagine that simplicity or identity. So we might imagine ourselves to be a simple and enduring thing. And that might be a very, um, uh, we might have this strong uh, tendency to have that imagined uh, notion of ourselves, but it doesn't seem to be supported by any of our actual experience. So Hume is claiming that when one looks inward for one's own mind, all one finds is a bundle of impressions. That's a phrase from Hume. A bundle of impressions, experiences, again, worries, sensations, smells, uh, one uh, succeeding the other endlessly, right? No, this seems to be very close to saying there is no enduring me, only a current of experiences. Mind is a cascade of impressions. There is no enduring ego. There is no single mind. Hume is denying the reality of or at least claiming we have no empirical grounds for positing the self. Curiously, this seems similar to the Buddhist or Zen Buddhist notion uh, of the non-reality of the ego, right? Uh, the denial of this sort of Cartesian ego that you are this enduring thinking thing. It also seems quite close to the notion coming out of the 20, uh, well, 19th and 20th century philosopher, Alfred North Whitehead, who makes a similar point in his book, Process and Reality, where he says this, in the quotation from the second meditation, I am, I exist is necessarily true each time I pronounce it or I mentally conceive it. He's referring to Descartes now. Whitehead says, Descartes adopts the position that an act of experience is the primary type of actual occasion. But in his subsequent developments, he assumes that his mental substance endure change. Here he goes beyond his argument. For each time he pronounces, I am, I exist, the actual occasion, which is the ego, is different. So what he's saying is, is Descartes pushes his argument further than it's warranted because he's assuming it's the same he saying, I exist each time. And this is what Whitehead is calling into question. Again, this is what Hume is calling into question. For Hume, we can only claim that there are phenomena, in other words, experiences, sensations, 
on empirical grounds. And so what he seems to be uh, advocating, or what he is advocating, is a position known as phenomenalism. The view that the only things which exist are experiences or impressions or phenomena. Um, perhaps more modestly, we might say all that we can know to exist are phenomena. Right? There might be other things, that, but we just have no knowledge of them. Uh, committed neither, phenomenalism is committed neither to physical substance nor to mental substance. So it seems to be the denial of any kind of uh, enduring substance substance whatsoever, or at least claiming, again, either it's the out and out denial, there is any such thing as an enduring substance, or it's the more modest claim to say we cannot know that there are any enduring existing substances. So let's quickly review the three possible um, uh, positions now that we, well, there, there's more, right, but we'll, we'll limit ourselves now to these uh, possible metaphysical positions. There's substance dualism, we call that Descartes as a dualist, and he wants to say that there are two distinct enduring kinds of substances, physical substance and mental substance. And then there would be substance monism, and substance monism comes in two varieties. One variety of substance monism is to deny there are two and says, no, no, there's only one, and that stuff, that substance is physical. So this would be the position of materialism or physicalism. The other variety of substance monism would be saying there's only one kind of enduring uh, stuff, there's only one kind of substance, but that is ideal or mind or mental. So this would be idealism, and of course this is Berkeley uh, and his view. What Hume is offering is a third, which is the denial of substance dualism and the denial of any kind of substance monism, it's simply the denial of substance whatsoever. And it's the claim that the only things which exist, or at least the only things that we are justified in asserting to exist, are phenomena or mental sensations. Hume is simply taking empiricism to its logical conclusion. Like his empiricist predecessors, Hume insists that all knowledge begins with basic units of sensory experience, what Hume calls impressions. Again, that was sort of like Locke's sensations. And these are the basic units, these sense data. But it would seem if our only source of knowledge is our own impressions, then the only things we can say exist are our own impressions. It seems uh, that, that that's almost a, a foregone conclusion. Oh, now Hume makes a difference between ideas and impressions. Um, so he's being a little more nuanced than Locke. Remember, Locke uses the word idea in a very broad sense, and basically any mental item is an idea. Um, Hume is going to distinguish between ideas and impressions. All the perceptions of the human mind resolve themselves into two distinct kinds, which I shall call impressions and ideas. This is David Hume now. The difference betwixt these consists in the degree of force and liveliness uh, with which they strike upon the mind and make their way into our thought or consciousness. So notice he's going to say that we have these mental items, ideas and impressions, and they're alike in that they're both mental items, but how are they different? They're different in the degree of force that or liveliness upon which they strike the mind. Right? They come to us unbidden, at least in some, some cases. Those perceptions which enter with most force and violence, doesn't necessarily mean violence there, uh, we may name impressions. And under this name, I comprehend all our sensations, passions, and emotions as they make their first appearance in the soul. So what he has in mind is those awarenesses, those mental um, uh, impression, um, sensations, phenomena, which come to us unbidden, we might say. I'm not trying to remember something. I'm not pulling it up out of memory. No, it's undeniable, right? I'm seeing orange. I'm smelling a rose, maybe something foul. Uh, and I can't avoid it, right? It enters into my awareness, unbidden uh, with, uh, with a certain striking force. By ideas, Hume continues, I mean the faint images of these in thinking and reasoning such as, for instance, all the perceptions excited by the present discourse, 
excepting only those which arise from the sight and touch and excepting the immediate pleasure or uneasiness it may occur. So as we are discussing and thinking and you're calling to mind certain ideas or you're remembering things from the past, likewise with me, those would be count as I, um, ideas. They're not impressions. They're not being impressed on me. They're being um, uh, uh, summoned by me, we might say, okay? So notice what he's not doing. He's not saying ideas are what's given to us by the outside and impressions, I'm sorry, impressions are what's given to us by the outside and ideas are stuff that's already inside because he's not thinking that we can maintain that inside outside distinction. We can't talk about an external world. We'll get to that in greater detail in a little bit. So he's not saying that the difference between impressions and ideas is one of origin, because in either case, do we know the origin? What's the difference? Liveliness and force, the phenomenal quality of the one versus the phenomenal quality of the other. This is Hume. Hume's reductionism. Well, Hume's reductionism really isn't any different than what Locke was attempting to do. Remember, according to Hume, simple ideas are derived from simple impressions. A simple impression would be a sensation of seeing red, round image, for instance. The simple idea would be something like the idea of red. So you have a sensation right, of seeing a red, round uh, sensation, right, sensation. And then from that experience of that sensation, you form an idea. So notice the one is an impression. You can't unsee that. Now it's you opened your eyes and there's the red experience that you're having unbidden. But then later on, you form a memory of that or a concept of that. And that becomes your simple idea. And then you can construct more complex ideas by weaving together these simple ideas or perhaps noting that these simple ideas always come in collections, et cetera. So the complex ideas, for example, the idea of an apple are complex arrangements and associate, associations of the simple idea. Again, very similar to Locke here. Beginning with Locke, empiricists were seeking to affect a reduction of knowledge to sense data. To justify a belief as knowledge, therefore, we must break it up into its, com uh, its complex ideas and those into simple ideas, and then trace back and find the impressions or sense data upon which those simple ideas are based. So this is the provenance that the reductionists from Locke to some, in some extent Barclay and certainly Hume and there, thereafter, uh, this was something they were seeking to do complex ideas get broken down into simple ideas that can trace down to simple impressions. And so for a complex idea to be legitimate, we have to be able to do that provenance. We have to be able to trace it back to experience. Remember they're empiricists after all. Any idea for which we could not provide this kind of analysis was illegitimate and inconsistent with the tenets of pure empiricism. If I claim to see an apple, for instance, I analyze my experience. My idea that there is an apple out there depends on my seeing several red round images from different angles on different occasions, feeling something smooth, tasting something fruity and tart and so on. So my idea of an apple is a complex and it's broken down into more simple ideas, smooth, tart, fruity, uh, red, round, solid, et cetera. The implication for the new sciences, and remember science is off, modern science is just getting kicked off now. The implications for the new sciences of the enlightenment is that they must be careful to ground their scientific theories in what is actually given in experience. And so uh, Hume and other enlightenment thinkers are going to be cautioning these new scientists, these new physicists and chemists and biologists not to uh, uh, push their theories or pull into their theories things which are not actually grounded in experience and observation and experiment. That is, any theoretical statements must be built up, as it were, out of observation statements, which themselves rest on the testimony of direct observation. Again, that 
idea, the theoretical statements, the complex idea that should be traced back to simple ideas, which should be traced back to simple sensations that you get through observation, experiment, uh, conducting scientific research. Whoops, did I do that right? Okay. Slide aside, we want to talk about Hume's fork. Now, Hume is suggesting that claims come in two varieties, relations of ideas and matters of fact. So relations of ideas would be statements like uh, all bachelors are unmarried or all vixen are foxes. Um, and what they are are uh, a priori claims or claims that can be known independent of experience. They do not rely on experience, right? So they're not uh, experiential. Uh, they're not a posteriori. They're what's called a priori. And we've talked about that word a couple of times now. If it helps you to remember it by saying prior to, that's fine. But again, it's not temporally prior to experience. It's supposed to mean logically prior to experience. But these relations of ideas tend to be definitional. All bachelors are unmarried. Notice, I don't try to verify the fact that all bachelors are unmarried by going around and uh, taking a poll, right? Going door to door. Excuse me, sir, are you a bachelor? Yes, I am. Are you also unmarried? Yes, I am. Okay, thank you. I go to the next house. Excuse me, sir, are you a bachelor? Yes, I am. Are you also unmarried? Yes, I am. Okay, thank you. No, I could do that, I suppose, but it'd be a colossal waste of my time. Why? Well, because we know the concept of bachelor contains within it the concept of being unmarried, an unmarried male, maybe a few other elements as well. So that's why he, mean, he refers to these as relations of ideas, because the idea of bachelor is related to the idea of unmarried in such a way that I can know that anything which is a bachelor is unmarried and anything which is married is not a bachelor. You can't satisfy um, the definition of a bachelor and be married at the same time. But also notice that these conceptual truths at least are a little bit, um, well, they are analytic, meaning if I analyze the subject term bachelor, I see that unmarried was there the whole time. So when I say all un, uh, bachelors are unmarried, all I'm really saying is all unmarried are unmarried. Is that true? Absolutely. Is that interesting? Not in the least. But that's what men, is meant by saying they're analytic. By analyzing the subject concept, I see that the predicate was there the whole time. But for this reason, they tend to be non-augmentative. Musicians might know that to augment a chord is to increase the number of notes in the chord. Well, non-augmentative would be uh, claims which don't augment our knowledge. In other words, uh, you know, imagine you, uh, your mother was asking, oh, what did you learn in your Zoom lecture today, dear? And you went, oh, mother, such interesting things. Um, I learned that all bachelors are unmarried. Uh, I learned that all Vixen are foxes. Uh, I learned that all marble statues are made of stone. Oh my gosh, get your money back. You're wasting your time. Why? Because any of those things are false? No, all of those are quite true. They're just non-augmentative. I'm not increasing your knowledge. If you know that marble is a kind of stone, then you already know that marble statues are made of stone. Yeah. Right? It's a no-brainer. Again, all sisters are siblings would be an example. Most are trivial, but many philosophers, and Hume, I think, is among them, uh, thought that math and geometry were a priori sciences. Right now, they don't seem to be non-augmentative. I mean, I, I, they certainly aren't as trivial as claims like um, "all sisters are siblings." But what uh, what some philosophers have suggested is, yeah, but they are to a, a sufficiently uh, intelligent mind. That if we had, say, the mind of God, then um, all of math would be as trivial as uh, a equals a or b equals b, or sisters are siblings or uh, marble statues are made of stone. Right? Uh, the, the difference is, is that we don't have the command, the mental command, uh, to see how obvious these uh, mathematical uh, and geometric relations are. Not everyone agreed that math and geometry were a priori sciences that fall into this category, uh, but many have. And they certainly seem to be, at least initially, they seem to be a priori. I mean, they seem to be independent 
of experience, not arising from experience. But that brings us to our second category, matters of fact. Matters of fact claims are empirical. They are grounded in experience. They are grounded in observation. They are um, matters that can be known and, and, and shown to be true or false based on experience and observation, right? Unlike A equals A claims, all bachelors are married. These are what's called synthetic. So they're not analytic, they're synthetic A equals B. In other words, I'm synthesizing two different concepts. Were I to say all swans are white, well, white doesn't mean swan and swan doesn't mean white. They are two different concepts and I'm synthesizing them. I'm saying every A thing is a B thing. Well, of course, the only way to tell whether that synthesis actually holds and describes the world is to go out and look. So these empirical synthetic claims are augmentative. They are increasing our knowledge. If they're true, I suppose they are misinforming us if they're false. All swans are white would be one such claim. The only way to justify it is to go out and look. <coughs> and roughly, this is going to cover scientific claims. And again, I'm thinking of science in the broadest sense to include the social sciences, historical claims, that sort of thing. Now, according to Hume, these are the only kinds of claims that we can justify. In other words, there's only two ways to justify a claim uh, as according to these two methods of justification. A claim can be justified a priori true when its denial is a logical contradiction Alternatively, a claim can be justified as true when it is provable through scientific investigation. Let me go back to the first uh, one. A priori, its denial is a logical contradiction. The rationalists, that we only looked at Descartes in any great detail in this course, but the rationalists would have held that there are many things that can be known a priori. Right? Um, and not always are these claims the denial of which involves a logical contradiction. So uh, I think it was uh, in, uh, we, we covered very briefly Leibniz's um, identity, you know, the indiscernibility of identicals as a principle, where he thought uh, that if two things are in fact identical, they must share all of the same properties and be indiscernible. Well, that was something he thought we could know a priori, not because it's denial um, uh, involves a contradiction, but he thought it was sort of self-evident or evident to reason. So the rationalists had a rather a more robust notion of what can be known a priori and uh, what can be proven a priori. Hume is very clear here. He thinks the only things that can be proven a priori are statements, the denial of which is a logical contradiction. So I can prove all bachelors are unmarried because the claim some bachelors are married is a logical contradiction. Now, if I can't do that, if the denial of the claim is not itself a logical contradiction, then it can't be proven a priori. And the only other way to prove it or to justify it would be as a matter of fact, empirical, scientific. Okay. So those are the only two uh, options left for us. But this raises an intriguing question. What if a belief cannot be justified in either of these ways? In other words, what if I believe something that I cannot prove true or false as a relation of ideas, nor can I prove it true or false by employing the scientific method? What are we to make of it then? Hume considers such a thing. Quoting from Hume, one of my favorite quotes, when we run over our libraries persuaded of these principles, what havoc must we make? If we take in our hand any volume of divinity or school metaphysics, for instance, let us ask, does it contain any abstract reasoning concerning quantity or number? In other words, is it math? Is it geometry? Is it provable a priori? No. Well, does it contain any experimental reasoning of matters of fact and existence? Is it science? No. Commit it then to the flames, for it can contain nothing but sophistry and illusion. What is he saying here? He's saying, look, if I come across theories or claims or whatnot, which is neither math nor geometry, nor is it empirical science, then commit it to the flames. 
or can contain nothing but sophistry and illusion. Right? Um, this is his attack on metaphysics. Metaphysics and, and theology, whether that be natural theology or revealed theology, because these are sentences or theories which don't, um, that, that can't be justified in either of the ways allowed by Hume. If I clean, uh, wait, wait, what did I do here? Oh, I, this is continuing on. If I claim that there exist objects of a certain kind, let's say apples, right? I say there are apples. I must identify the simple ideas and impressions upon which my knowledge is based. So I can reference uh, uh, red sensations and round sensations and solid sensations and sweet sensations and tart sensations and how these form ideas of sweetness, redness, roundness, and how this forms a more complex idea of an apple, etc. So I can do the provenance. Quoting from Hume, likewise, if I make a metaphysical claim about the existence of God or substances, I must either be pre-approved to identify the ideas and impressions upon which such a claim is based, or I must show that it is uh, nothing other than a relation of ideas. Otherwise, the claim cannot be justified. In other words, committed to the flames. So when I say there exists an immaterial soul, and think of it this way, two individuals, and they're debating whether there exists an immaterial soul. And the one person says, yes, there does exist an immaterial soul. And the other says, no, there does not exist an immaterial soul. What Hume is going to say is, wait, 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 you know, what do you disagree about? Well, the soul, ah, do you disagree about any empirical claims? Do you disagree about what can be tasted, what can be touched, what can be smelled, what can be heard, what can be felt, any impressions? Are one of you having impressions that the other one hasn't had or, is that it? it doesn't seem to be. So you don't seem to be disagreeing about any matters of fact. Do you disagree about any logical contradictions, uh, logic or math or geometry. Is, there, is that in there? Doesn't seem to be. Well, then commit it to the flames. For its sophistry and illusion, you really don't disagree about anything at all. This is Hume's unveiled threat to traditional metaphysics. Hume insists that every justifiable belief must be either a relation of ideas, for example, a statement of mathematics, logic, or a trivial conceptual truth, or a matter of fact, which can be confirmed by an appeal to experience. This either or is often referred to as Hume's fork, and that's how I'm referring to it now, relations of ideas or matters of fact. Now, some rationalist philosophers had also insisted that claims be justifiable by a priori reason or by experience. But Hume narrows a priori rational truths to logical tautologies. So unlike those other rationalist philosophers, Hume thinks of a very restricted um, uh, test for a priori, what can be proven or known to be true a priori. Now metaphysical doctrines cannot be defended by either of the methods allowed by Hume. They are, by their very nature, about things beyond everyday experience. For example, God or substance or immaterial soul, minds, for instance. And so are not based on any impressions. Nor are they relations of ideas that can be demonstrated by a simple logical or mathematical proof. Therefore, according to Hume, they cannot be justified at all. The problem, however, is that the same argument extends far beyond the admittedly speculative claims of metaphysics. So even if metaphysics was his initial target, it seems that his shotgun is taking out more than just traditional metaphysics. It also undermines some of the beliefs that are most essential to our everyday experiences as well. Hume actually does single out three such beliefs, causality, induction, and external reality. And Hume is going to criticize each in turn. And it basically, he's going to criticize causality as ultimately resting on induction and induction as being unjustified and therefore um, undermining our confidence that there's any such thing as an external reality. So that's where we're going next. 
The three basic beliefs are intimately tied together. The principle of induction supports our notion of causation, as we'll see in a moment. And the universal belief in universal causation supports the causal theory of perception and our common sense belief in an external world as the supposed cause or source of our perceptions. So let's look at each of these three in turn. First, the principle of universal causation. First, human examines our idea of causation or causality. That is that uh, of one event bringing about or causing or necessitating another event, event A causing event B. This idea, which provides what Hume calls the strongest connections of our experience, and elsewhere he calls it the cement of the universe, we derive a most important principle from this idea, right? um, the principle of universal causation, that every event has a cause. Right? It remains a question as to what that cause might be, but we believe that every event has a cause. That is the principle of universal causation, again, that every event has a cause or causes. It is evident that we invoke such a principle every time we explain anything. For example, the car won't start. And we will search and search for the car. And even if everything seems to check out, the carburetor, the, ex, uh, the electrical system or, or whatnot, we continue to search for the cause of why this car won't start. Now, we might be searching for hours without finding the cause, but there's one thing we know for certain. We know that there must be a cause, even if it's very elusive. So imagine you have all the automotive sophistication of me, which is to say none, and uh, your car does, well, let's just take me, right? My car doesn't start with it. And so I call and have it towed to my mechanic and I take an Uber to work and I later call the mechanic, did you get my car? Yes, I did. Well, have you had a chance to look at it? He says, yes, I had a chance to look at it and good news, there is nothing wrong with your car. Oh my gosh, that's wonderful. It's starting then. Because no, no, it still won't start. But you just said there was nothing wrong with it. Oh no, there's nothing wrong with it. So it's starting. No, it's not starting. Wait, I don't understand. It's not starting. That's correct. It's not starting. But there's nothing wrong with it. That's right. Well, no, there, there's got to be a cause, right? It's, if it's not starting, there has to be a cause for why it's not starting. And my mechanic says, oh, oh, oh. You think I subscribe to the principle of universal causation? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. I think some things just happen for no reason whatsoever, and your car not start it, starting is one of them. And so that's what's going on here. Your car won't start, but there's no cause for why it won't start. All right. Well, then I would have my car towed to a different mechanic, and maybe beforehand I double check. You know, uh, do you believe in the principle of universal causation? Yes, I do. Okay, fine. Please work on my car. Right? Note, if your mechanic told you that there was in fact nothing wrong with your car and that there was simply no cause for it not starting, you would seek out a different mechanic, one who does subscribe to the principle of universal causation. Likewise with your doctor, right? You wouldn't say, oh yeah, you know, there's actually no reason why you have that rash, right? Or, oh, there's really no reason why your blood pressure is so high or your psychologist or your architect or your scientist, okay? So we seem in our everyday life to be committed to the principle of universal causation. What we would not accept, what we would deem not possible is that there be no cause. So the principle is presupposed in our everyday thinking as well as an operating assumption of science, medicine, automotive repair, et cetera, architecture. In that sense, right? So we, it, it's always operating in the background for science, et cetera. You may recognize this principle as a version of Gottfried Leibniz's principle of sufficient reason, um, which substitutes a more Newtonian notion of cause for the notion of reason. Leibniz had said there has to be, for any true claim, there has to be a reason why it's true and not otherwise. That was his principle of sufficient reason. And again, he thought that this was something which is evident or self-evident. Now, because of this confidence in causation, every event <coughs> has a cause, and it's universal applicability that we think of ourselves as justified in drawing conclusions 
about what is beyond our immediate ideas. In other words, to predict the future or to explain the past. But where does this confidence in the principle of universal causation come from? What grounds this confidence? How do we come to know that this is true, that every event in the universe has a cause? <clears throat> what justifies this confidence is the is it a principle of reason, a priori reason? In other words, is it a relation of ideas? <coughs> Pardon me. Well, um, I'll, uh, spoiler alert. Notice, is the idea of an uncaused event a logical impossibility? In other words, is it absolutely impossible to imagine an uncaused event? Like it's impossible to imagine a married bachelor, is it similarly impossible to imagine an uncaused event? And notice, if the answer to that question is no, it's not impossible, then it can't be something I know via a priori reason. So if I know it at all, I'd have to know it by, um, as a matter of fact, but I'm ahead of myself. Again, if it were truly a principle of a priori reason, a relation of ideas, then its denial should imply a contradiction. Quoting from Hume, we can never demonstrate the necessity of a cause to every new existence or new modification of existence without showing at the same time the impossibility that a thing can ever begin to exist without some productive principle. So what he's saying is here is, if I were to try to show the necessity that every event has a cause or every modification of an existing thing has a cause or the beginning of all things, uh, of every object has to be caused, right? So if I'm gonna show that all these things have to be caused, I'd have to show that uh, it is impossible that a thing could begin to exist or a thing could be modified without a cause. Now, how would I show that as impossible? He is saying here that proving that every event must have a cause, universal causation, requires proving that an uncaused event is impossible. Recall that Hume believed that the only things that could be proven necessarily true a priori are those claims, the negation of which implies a logical contradiction. And where the latter proposition, the negation implies such contradiction, cannot be proved, we must despair of ever being able to prove the former. That is, the proposition is necessarily true. So if I can't show that a proposition, the negation of a proposition implies a contradiction, then I can't show that the proposition is necessarily true. It might be true, but it's not necessarily true, and I can't prove it a priori. Since there seems to be no logical contradiction in the idea of an uncaused thing, or an uncaused event, we cannot know that every event has a cause a priori, right? Is, now, all we've done is say one, um, one route to, to this knowledge, relations of ideas is not going to work for us. It will be easy for us to conceive of any object to be existent this moment. Oh, I'm sorry. It will be easy for us to conceive any object to be non-existent this moment and existent the next without conjoining to it the distinct idea of a cause or productive principle. So I can imagine no bowling ball on my desk, poof, bowling ball on my desk. And that experience, that imagined experience doesn't seem to be impossible or illogical in any way. And it doesn't involve the idea of a productive principle. In other words, my experience does not reveal to me a cause of the bowling ball. Yes, it wasn't there one moment, and now it is, but that in and of itself is not connected to the idea of caused bowling ball. I don't get it from the, the, uh, the uh, uh, so I could imagine an uncaused bowling ball. The separation, therefore, of the idea of a cause from that of a beginning of existence is plainly possible for imagination. So my idea of bowling ball beginning to exist this moment does not seem to be necessarily connected to bowling ball 
having been caused this moment, that these are separable. And I could imagine one without the other, and I can imagine an uncaused bowling ball. Now, maybe I'm beating a dead horse here, maybe you already got it, but. And consequently, the actual separation of these objects is so far possible that it implies no contradiction or absurdity. So since I could imagine this scenario, there doesn't seem to be anything absurd about it. I don't know that I believe it to be true, uncaused bowling balls popping into existence, but there's nothing logically impossible about uncaused bowling balls popping into existence. That's his point. And is therefore incapable of being refuted by any reasoning from mere ideas, without which it is impossible to demonstrate the necessity of a cause. So I can't show that bowling balls have necessarily have causes. Maybe they do. Maybe each and every bowling ball that's ever existed has been caused. <coughs> but I can't prove it a priori. If I'm going to prove it at all, I'm going to have to prove it in some other way as a sort of scientific, empirical matter of fact. And maybe, maybe that's doable. Since we can imagine any one set of sense data being followed by any other, there is no necessary connection between any two events, including allegedly cause and effect event. So um, if I see event A and then I see event B, um, I could imagine event A without imagining event B. I could imagine event B without imagining event A. They seem to be themselves separate and distinct now, later, I might come to believe that A is the cause of B, that A necessitates B. <laughs> but where did that come from? Not from my initial observation. I see A, I see B. Did I know that A produced B on the basis of that observation? Clearly not. I may come to that belief later on, but certainly initially, there's nothing about one event that necessitates another event I could imagine them in any number of orders. I could imagine B and then A for that matter. This is what Hume is saying. So the implication that any effect, whether that be a change or the actualization of a contingent thing could in principle occur without a cause. Now we're just repeating ourselves. So it would appear that our belief in causation and causes cannot be grounded in reason, again, a priori reason, so long as reason is limited to the realm of knowing what is logically impossible. Again, what is conceivable without contradiction. But of course, the rationalists like Leibniz would never have consented to such an impoverished notion of rational truths. So Hume isn't a rationalist, he's an empiricist, but the rationalists thought that we have innate ideas and that their, their trove of innate a priori ideas is much more robust than Hume is allowing here. So again, again, I'm probably beating a dead horse here, all events are events would be a relation of ideas. I have a little diagram sentence here for you. Right? But all events are caused events is not a relation of ideas. That's Hume's point. So it can't be proven a priori. Okay, might our belief in causation and causes be grounded in experience then, as a matter of fact? Thus the statement, every event has a cause cannot be justified as a relation of ideas. If it can be justified at all though, maybe it's justified as a matter of fact, of observation. Where we say, look, that event had a cause, that event has a cause, that event has a cause, and then we sort of generalize. Well, I think all events have causes, probably. But this means being able to find some simple sensations on which the idea of cause is based. But hold on now, we have a little bit of a problem, right? Because um, what is given in experience is merely a finite set of instances of constant conjunctions of two events, according to Hume. B has always been preceded by A when observed. We therefore conclude that A necessitates B. On its own, this is surely unjustified. 
what we observe is a constant conjunction that for all we know is accidental. But what we assert is a necessary connection. So the first time I see A and then I see B, I don't know that A causes B. But then I see A and B and then 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 I'm noticing a constant conjunction of A's and B's. And never do I see B that wasn't preceded by an A. All right now I'm starting to believe that A is causing B, but wait a minute, am I going too fast? Well, if all I get is constant conjunction, then yeah, that is going too fast. Because what I witness is a finite and potentially accidental um, cor uh, correlation. What I'm asserting is a necessary causal connection. And so my theoretical input is far, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, my, my data input, my, my informational input <coughs> is far less than this more expansive claim I'm making as my theoretical output, A causes B. That's not justified at this point. The repeated observations can explain the psychological expectation of B when witnessing an A. Think of Pavlov's dog, right? He hears the bell, he gets food. He hears the bell, he gets food. He hears the bell, he gets food. You ring the bell, he expects food because he's seen this constant conjunction and witnessed it over such a long time. But the claim that there is a necessary connection is unwarranted. It's an unwarranted inference if it's based on the constant conjunction alone. Again, because like Pavlov's dog, all perhaps all we've witnessed is an accidental um, cor correlation. All of, uh, quoting from Hume, all events seem entirely loose and separate. One event follows another, but we never observe any tie between them. They seem conjoined, but never connected. And as we can have no idea of anything which never appeared to our outward sense or inward sentiment, the necessary conclusion seems to be that we have no idea of a connection or power at all. And that these words are absolutely without meaning when employed either in philosophical reasoning or in common life. <clears throat> so what is he saying here? We have this supposed idea of necessary connection is that idea of necessary connection something that can be traced back to some simple sensation? Is there some simple sensation where we build up necessary connection? No. Well, if it can't be traced back to a simple sensation, then it is empty. It's illegitimate. It's not a, it's not, we have no idea what we're talking about when we talk about necessary connections, or so says Hume, at least not on the basis of those observations alone. Hume is pointing out that there is no simple sensation that appertains to the idea of cause or necessitating. If there were, if the cause of B were truly given in experience, we would know that A causes B merely by observation the very first time. In other words, we'd see the causing happening. If it were there to be seen, we'd see it the first time. We would see A causing B the very first time we witnessed the two, if it were there to be seen at all. But we do not know or see that A causes B the first time. If so, then neither do we see it the second time or the third or the fourth or so on. In other words, we see A, then B, A, then B, A, then B, A, then B. Let's go back to the first time, A, then B. Do we see anything necessary about that? No. Oh, but then again, A and B. Do we see something that's there? Maybe we missed it the first time and it was there the second time. No. Now it's the hundredth time, A, then B. Do we, is that the time we saw it? No, there's nothing there to see. There is no simple sensation. There is no phenomena of necessity or necessitating. All there is is a constant conjunction and it carries with it a kind of psychological explanation. A, oh, probably B. B, oh my gosh. But that's psychological. That's not logical. That's not justification. If this is so, causation is not given in direct experience. So where does it come from then? 
That is, if we do not witness a cause and effect relationship directly between two events, how or why do we come to believe that there is some necessary connection between the two? Hume asks, how do we go from observing irregularity occur a finite number of times to predicting that it will occur an infinite number of times? Again, the data input is finite. The predictive output is infinite. That's not, that's not justifiable. Again, were I to say the rate of free fall is 32 feet per second per second, <coughs> well, that's what we've observed a finite number of times. <coughs> But what I'm alleging is that it shall always be thus and so. Where does that come from? What justifies that much more expansive claim? That is, if we do not witness the cause and effect relationship between the two events directly, then how is it that we believe in them? Oh, I've said all this except the last bullet. Hugh asks, what makes us believe this? What makes us believe that the past experience is a reliable guide predicting future experience. Now, the obvious place to start is to suggest that our observations of the past and present have relevance to our observations of the future. We, uh, can we not, in fact, draw inductive generalizations from our experience, something I mentioned several slides ago. That is, can we not move from knowledge about the past and present to knowledge about the future and the causes of things. I mean, notice if it was A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, then aren't we likely to say, okay, maybe A isn't the cause of B, but it's pretty likely A is the cause of B, right? So we'd have an inductive. Probably A necessitates B, A generates B, A brings about B on the basis of this sort of inductive inference. But what could justify that mental move? Well, he's pointing out you need something else, another presumption working in the background. You need two things. A has always preceded B in the past, but you also need the belief that the past is a reliable guide to predicting the future. You need both. And this is what he calls the principle of induction. That the future will be like the past. Now, the future will be like the past in broad outline. He doesn't mean that, um, you know, it's Groundhog Day and, and uh, every day is going to be exactly the same. Of course not. But what he does mean is we believe that patterns like A, B, A, B, A, B, objects dropping to the earth at a rate of 32 feet per second per second, not accounting for wind resistance or air resistance. Um, when we observe these patterns, we think that the patterns we've observed long standing in the past will continue into the future. And so that sun rose in the east yesterday and for every, as long as anybody could remember, it's gonna rise in the east tomorrow, probably. Why? Well, because it's a pattern. Um, everybody who ate arsenic in the past died. Arsenic probably is the cause of their death. Right? It's not just an accidental correlation. And so arsenic is poisonous and causes death. Bread is nourishing. and People who eat breads are nourished by that bread. How do I know? Well, it's always happened in the past and it's probably gonna to happen tomorrow or maybe tonight when I have to eat bread with dinner. We believe that the future will be like the past at least in broad outline. That is, we believe that the universe works by laws or patterns that will not and cannot change. And therefore patterns of behavior long witnessed to have held in the past will continue into the future indefinitely. This is the unstated premise of all inductive arguments. This is what makes us believe that past experience is a reliable guide to predicting future experience. In making predictions about the future or explanations about the past, we presuppose the principle of induction. That is, that, a natural pat uh, that the natural patterns of reality, the laws of nature that have always held in the past and allow us to explain past behavior will continue to hold in the future and will also predict um, the future. So why is it that everybody who ate arsenic in the past died? Because arsenic is the cause of their death. 
it's poisonous. And I base that on induction. If I eat arsenic now, I'll probably die. Why? I base that on experience. Arsenic is poisonous. So it's claims about explanations from past and it's claims about predictions of future. Again, since everyone who ate arsenic in the past died immediately afterwards, arsenic must have been the cause of their death. Since everyone who ate arsenic in the past died immediately afterwards, if I eat arsenic now, I will die. Hence, the principle of induction is relied upon to ground our confidence in universal causation when making claims about the future or making causal claims about the past. Thus, the indu uh, thus induction takes on the character. A had always been followed by B in the past. The future will be like the past. A will be followed by B today. A necessitates B. Beliefs about causes or the future all depend on the principle of induction. Imagine, for instance, that I told you that at 5 p.m. today, all the laws of physics would cease to hold and would be replaced by new laws. If this were so, you could not tell me what the world would look like at 501. For all we know, arsenic might stop being poisonous and bread might stop being nourishing. In other words, at 501, instead of gravity holding us on the planet, it might throw us all off, for all we know. <coughs> That's if all the laws of physics change. But I don't believe all the laws of physics are going to change at 501 this afternoon. Neither do you. I believe that the future will be like the past. And so do you. I believe that the patterns that we've identified as laws of nature will govern future experience just as they have um, inductively or, 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 or seem, seems to have um, structured past experience. Okay. Now we have our three concepts that we can look at the actual problem of induction. And it actually goes very quickly after this. The problem of induction turns on three concepts. The traditional account of knowledge, which we've talked about already, Hume's fork, which I've laid out earlier in this presentation, and the principle of induction, which I've just now introduced. Again, the traditional account of uh, knowledge, going back to Plato, basically says that to know some proposition P, the subject S knows that P requires that S believes P, that P is true, and S is justified in her belief that P. In other words, that knowledge is true, justified belief. That those three elements, belief, truth, and justification are uh, each necessary and jointly sufficient for knowledge. It highlights the importance of justification as a necessary for any truthful description of knowledge. Hume accepts this, most of the philosophers of his day did, and even thereafter. Thus, the crucial epistemological question becomes, what is justification? What are the ways we can justify a belief? But of course, we've already just looked at Hume's answer to that question. There's only two ways to justify a belief, as a relation of ideas or as a matter of fact. Now we can put it all together. To be justified, a belief must be either a relation of ideas or a matter of fact. All inductive beliefs ultimately rely on the principle of induction, that is, the claim that the future will be like the past. Is the principle of induction a relation of ideas? In other words, is the principle of induction a um, tautology or a logical truth, the denial of which is an impossibility? definitional, non-augmentative, knowable a priori? No, it doesn't seem to be. Could we imagine the future not being like the past? Yes, we were just doing that a moment ago, right? I could imagine arsenic not poisoning me. I could imagine flying off the surface of the earth rather than being held fast to it by, by gravity. So I could imagine the future being quite different than the past. So the claim the future will be like the past does not seem to be an a priori truth. It's not a relation of ideas. Well, we maybe thought, I didn't think it was gonna be a relation of ideas anyway. Okay, but then we ask the next question. Is the principle of induction a matter of fact? Is the principle of induction an empirical truth that we can demonstrate to be true and justify as true based on observation? 
Oh dear. No. The principle of induction is not a matter of fact. <clears throat> Why is that? Because I can't observe the future. So I can't gain or, or gather observational data to confirm the claim that the future will be like the past. Now you might say, well, wait now, but the future always was like the past. In the past, oh, but that won't be, that's not good enough. Because all that's saying is the past has been like the past. But that's not what you're claiming. You're claiming the future will be like the past. And where's your observational data for that? So it's not a relation of ideas. It's not a matter of fact. Therefore, the principle of induction cannot be justified. Therefore, nothing that relies on the principle of induction can be justified. Therefore, what can never be said to have justified belief about the future or the causes of things. I never justified in my claims that the sun will rise tomorrow in the east or that arsenic is poisonous. Why? It's based on induction and induction is unjustified. Therefore, one can never be said to have knowledge about the future or the causes of things. Notice from Hugh's perspective, it is incorrect to say, I know the sun will rise tomorrow. Or I could even know that the sun will rise tomorrow. I can't say I know that arsenic is poisonous. Mm, seems a little problematic. Again, putting it all together. This is the same sum up, but slightly more succinct. To know something, one must have justification. Traditional account of knowledge. One cannot get justification for the principle of induction. It's not a relation of ideas, not a matter of fact. Therefore, one cannot know the principle of induction. Therefore, one cannot know anything based on the principle of induction. Okay, so so much the worse for science, right? Since the principle of induction is unjustified, it cannot provide justification for any other beliefs. Therefore, no beliefs which depend on the principle of induction are justified, nor can they be known. Science or claims about the future or causality. Again, they may be true. Maybe the sun will rise tomorrow. But what Hume is saying is, and I have absolutely no reason to think that it will. Maybe arsenic will poison me and bread will nourish me, but I have no rational justification for my belief that it will. The most I have is a psychological expectation. Well, that's not knowledge. All right, we have a problem here. A skeptic. A skeptic is one who claims that knowledge is impossible. Hume is a skeptic with regard to the future and causality. So look, the sun will rise tomorrow or it won't, but I can't know it. So I have to be a skeptic about whether the sun will rise tomorrow. And if I believe it, I believe it without rational justification, says Hume. And he's not telling me I, not to believe it. He's just saying, realize you have no rational uh, justification for it. Possible solution. Well, one might claim that Hume's fork is missing a tine. In other words, instead of having only two, oh, you can't see, but I'm holding up two fingers. So two. Maybe there's a third tine. In other words, maybe there's another way of justifying beliefs. <coughs> um, one might consider Immanuel Kant or William James here as offering alternatives. That's one way you might try to get around Hume's problem. The third of our common sense beliefs Remember, he's, he's criticizing universal causation, criticizing the principle of induction, and now the third, the external world. Hume calls this into question as well. Hume calls into question the belief in an external world that is a physical or material world which exists independently of our impressions and ideas and which is the cause of our impressions. Bishop Barclay had already done Hume's work for him here, right? Barclay had shown why we can't go from having our sensations to belief in a non-mental uh, non reality or external world. Hume, following Barclay, also rejects all notion of substance as unintelligible, including even the minimal that I know not what that Locke had suggested. But where Barclay had turned the rejection of matter and physical substance into a metaphysics namely his subjective idealism, and used it to defend the existence of God, Hume rejects 
this idealist metaphysics of Berkeley, as well as remains wholly skeptical, refusing to accept the existence of God. He remains firm in his assistance. Hey, let's try that again. He remains firm in his insistence that our belief in the existence of anything is no different from, quote, the idea of what we conceive to be existent. But this undermining of our notion of mind independent external world to which our represent representations correspond is one of the crucial metaphysical presumptions of the traditional correspondence theory of truth and representational realism. So Hume has basically um, removed what as central and core to our notion of what is true. To say that something is true is to say it's describing the way the world really is. Again, our traditional notion of correspondence truth and representational realism wants to say that a sentence is true if it describes the mind independent world the way it really is. But Hume is saying we have no reason to believe there is a mind independent world and certainly no way of verifying whether we've truly described it or not. But if science is not in the business of describing the way the world really is, then what is it doing? What is objective truth? So Hume is raising all kinds of problems for us here. In sum, we can see that the three basic beliefs are intimately tied together. The principle of induction supports the principle of universal causation and the causal theory of perception supports the belief in an external world. Hume insists that all knowledge must be either relations of ideas or matters of fact, and then shows that cause and effect induction uh, are the basis for all reasoning about an external world, and finally proceeds to show that such reasoning can neither be justified as a relation of ideas nor as a simple matter of fact. On Hume's analysis, I cannot know that bread will nourish me or that arsenic will poison me. I cannot know that the sun will rise in the east tomorrow. In a way, I am worse off than Descartes at his solipsistic worst. Why? Since I can't even know that I exist as an enduring substance. Even when Descartes thought he existed as a thinking thing, he thought he persisted as a thinking thing. And Hume is suggesting, I don't even have reason to think that. Quote from Hume. It may therefore be a subject worthy of curiosity to inquire what is the nature of that evidence which assures us of any real existence and matter of fact beyond the present testimony of our senses or the records of our memory. It strikes me as something of an understatement, right? It might be a subject worthy of curiosity. He's just, he's just removed any rational support we have for thinking that there's an external world, uh, that the sun will rise tomorrow, that I uh, that the future will be like the past, you go, well, you know, that might be worth looking into. This part of philosophy, it is observable, has been little cultivated either by the ancients or moderns, and therefore our doubts and errors in the prosecution of so important an inquiry may be more excusable while we march through such difficult paths without any guide or direction. So he's saying, you know, people haven't taken this problem seriously up until this point, and so yeah, if we, if it's, if, if I've made some mistakes, if I've erred along the way, if I've overlooked something, perhaps I can be forgiven that because I'm, I'm kind of charting out new metaphysical and epistemological territory. Again, quoting from Hume, they may even prove useful, these speculations of his, by exciting curiosity and destroying that implicit faith and security which is the bane of all reasoning and free inquiry. The discovery of defects in the common philosophy, if any such there be, will not, I presume, be a discouragement, but rather an incitement, as is usual, to attempt something more full and satisfactory than has yet been proposed to the public. So he's saying here is, look, number one, realizing what you know and what you don't know and what you've taken them by implicit faith because you simply haven't thought about it, um, that uh, all of this is useful. Uh, the bane of, of reasoning and free inquiry is to believe you know something when you don't, or to believe you have good reason to uh, accept something when in fact you don't. Time's a lesson for us as well. 
And he's saying, well, maybe this will spur people on to further inquiry. Hume famously writes in his first book, The Treatise of Human Nature, quote, more fortunately, it happens that since reason is incapable of dispelling these clouds, nature herself suffices to that purpose and cures me of this philosophical melancholy and delirium, either by relaxing this bent of mind or by some avocation and lively impressions of my senses, which obliterate these chimeras. So he's saying, well, here, if I'm, I'm, you know, thinking through these things, and and reason can't come up with a solution to the problem, nature steps out in and takes over for me. I dine, he says. I play a game of backgammon. I converse, and I am merry with my friends. And when after three or four hours of amusement, I will return to these speculations, they appear so cold and strained and ridiculous that I cannot find it in my heart to enter into them any further. So he says, okay, look, I've really destroyed our rational support for all of these things and I don't see a way out of it, but hey, what are you gonna do? Have a nice meal, enjoy some time with your friends. <laughs> wait, <laughs> wait, wait, we can't just stop there. In my view, Hume is entirely victorious on the grounds he lays, as he lays them out. The resolution to his skepticism may require a kind of Copernican revolution in our thinking about the nature of knowledge and truth. And Immanuel Kant, the next philosopher we're going to be looking at, is about to provide just that. So this concludes my lecture on, uh, on David Hume and his problem of induction. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Hope has been um, uh, helpful, clear, and maybe even a little amusing, that was my point. And uh, until next time, thank you for paying attention.